Dr. Richard, are you listening to the English translation? Good afternoon, everyone, one and all attending the session. It's a great honor to open this debate cycle with activity in the uh, 11th Nebraska Congress. It couldn't be held this year in person. The uh, transfer to December 2021, the appearance of SARS-CoV-2 in human beings had been expected since the mid 20th century. We estimate that 60% of all the infectious, emerging infectious diseases in human beings are zoonotic diseases, and they're closely linked to uh, ecosystem health, uh, which are being destroyed at an unprecedented rate, beginning with Brazil. The UN described the coronavirus as a call for help by nature to humankind. Deforestation and wild areas have been motor forces behind the growing number of diseases that have uh, jumped from wild animals to humans. We have nearly 60 million cases of COVID-19, almost a million and a half deaths in the world. Brazil is the third leading country in the number of cases, uh, more than 600,000, uh, and nearly 150,000 deaths. And, Thousands of people will enter under the oh, below the poverty line. Women, poor, and the blacks are the ones that are suffering the most directly and indirectly from the effects of the epidemic. The Brazilian inequality was responsible for the epidemic. Millions of Brazilian have, have added to the millions of unemployed or underemployed prior to the epidemic, forming a mass of injured folds that are vulnerable to COVID-19 in Brazil. And inequality and unemployment have been terribly amplified by the lack of a response by a government that is insensitive, that refuses to meet the needs of a huge contingent of the Brazilian population who are accumulating living, living in poverty and misery. And this is a president who desires, denies the disease and despises the suffering and death of the Brazilians in response to this neglect and the lack of political coordination in the country. Abrasco, the Brazilian Association of Collective Health, has uh, tackled this fight in this health crisis and humanitarian crisis that we're experiencing. Ever since the beginning of the pandemic in Brazil, countless activities have been held and proposals have been made through all the areas comprised in collective health in Brazil, including the plan to fight COVID-19. Never in epidemiology, it's been discussed so much and used in theory and practice, and also uh, widely used in the fight against COVID-19. That is why Abrasco and its epidemiology committee decided that we should have a pre-Congress time for Epi 2021, where the scientific community could reflect on the impact of COVID-19 in the world, and especially in some countries that are profoundly affected, like the United States and Italy and Brazil. We This week, will, from 24th to 27th of November, through video conferences, listening to important Brazilian researchers and foreign researchers together, we're going to launch our view on the COVID-19 epidemic, understanding uh, the same as it's been presented in the different regions impacted by the growth of social gender racial and inequality and that of opportunities. We invite the participants to follow us in this journey for understanding the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in the world and especially specifically in Brazil and the responses to the crisis that are being proposed. We have the great pleasure to begin this debate cycle with the first speaker, who is Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, who is the Director General of the World Health Organization, WHO, a Master in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, a PhD in Community Medicine from the University of Not Nottingham. Dr. Tedros is also the Minister of Health of Ethiopia and from 2005 to 2012, supervising the transformation of the health system in Ethiopia, building 4,000 more clinics and training more than 30,000 health workers and community-based health workers. And the 123 per thousand infant mortality 2007 to 84 in 2011 and AIDS decreased by 90% in Ethiopia. The main priority is universal health coverage, uh, health for all. Dr. Tedros, it's a huge pleasure to have you with us and please, you have the floor. 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, uh, good afternoon and thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. It's hard to believe that less than a year ago, COVID-19 was still a completely unknown virus. In 11 short months, it has turned the world upside down. Although the COVID-19 pandemic is a health crisis, it's so much more than that. It has shaken the foundations of social, political, and economic security. Millions of jobs and livelihoods have been lost. Businesses have been jeopardized. The global economy is in recession, and geopolitical divisions have been deepened. More than 54 million cases of COVID-19 have now been reported to WHO and more than 1.3 million deaths. This is very tragic. Last week alone, more than 4 million cases and over 67,000 deaths were reported, the most in a single week so far. You know only too well that Brazil is among the most affected countries with more than 6 million cases and almost 170,000 deaths. After several months of declining cases and deaths, Brazil has seen an increase in the past few weeks. I would like to offer my deep condolences to all those in your country who have lost someone they love. I offer my deep respect and admiration for your health workers who have put themselves in harm's way to serve others. And I offer my deep commitment that WHO stands ready to support you in any way we can. Since the beginning of the pandemic, WHO has been providing the world with the evidence-based tools it needs to prevent, detect, and respond to COVID-19. At the same time, we knew that new tools would be needed. That's why WHO proposed the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator to develop vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics fast and allocate them fairly. With positive news from vaccine trials over the past few weeks, there is now real hope of bringing the pandemic under control. No vaccines in history have been developed as rapidly as this. The scientific community has a new standard for vaccine development. Now the international community must set a new standard for access. Every government rightly wants to do everything it can to protect its own people. But there is real risk that the poorest and most vulnerable people will be trampled in the stampede of for vaccines. Once safe and effective vaccines are approved, we must also use them effectively. And the best way to do that is by vaccinating some people in all countries rather than all people in some countries. Sharing is in the interest of each and every country. This is not charity. It's the fastest and smartest way to end the pandemic and accelerate the global economic recovery. In our interconnected world, if some people miss out on vaccines, the virus will continue to circulate and the global recovery will be delayed. Initially, vaccine supply will be limited, so health workers, older people and other at risk groups must come first. That's the best way to break the chains of transmission, save lives and restore confidence. 187 economies, including Brazil, are participating in the COVAX facility, which aims to ensure that vaccines are allocated equitably to all countries as global public goods. But it's important to emphasize that vaccines will complement not replace other proven public health measures. Surveillance will need to continue. Those infected will still need to be identified, tested, isolated, and cared for. Contacts will still need to be traced and quarantined. 
communities will still need to be engaged and individuals will still need to be careful. We still have a long road to travel and all countries must continue to take a balanced and comprehensive approach using all the tools. Every year millions of people are plunged into extreme poverty because the health services they need are not available or they cannot afford them. That's why WHO's top priority is universal health coverage built on the foundation of strong primary health care with an emphasis on access and equity. All roads should lead to universal health coverage. The pandemic has demonstrated that health is not simply a byproduct of development or a cost to be contained. It is the essential underpinning of productive, resilient and stable economies. The pandemic has shown why investments in public health and especially in health workers are so important. Far from being a choice between health and the economy, the pandemic has shown us that they are deeply intertwined. When people are healthy, they can learn, earn and innovate. When people are sick, the whole of society suffers. And when a pandemic hits, the entire foundation of economies can crumble. In recent years, many countries have made huge investments and advances in medicine, but too many have neglected their basic public health systems, which are the bedrock for preventing, preparing for, detecting and responding to outbreaks and for promoting health and preventing illness of all types. Brazil has a long and proud tradition in public health. The pandemic has taken a heavy toll on your country, but it has also demonstrated why public health is not a cost, but an investment in social, economic and political stability. 72 years ago, WHO was founded on the conviction that health is a human right, not a privilege for those who can afford it. And for more than 30 years, that right has been enshrined in the Constitution of Brazil. I give you my assurance that WHO and PAHO remain totally committed to working with you and supporting you to strengthen public health in Brazil and to make the right to health a reality across your vast and beautiful country. My brothers and sisters, the COVID-19 pandemic is a once in a century crisis but it's also a once in a century opportunity for building the healthier, safer, fairer and more sustainable world we all want. Thank you so much. Obrigado. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I understand you have to leave. Could you answer just a few questions before you leave? Um, my uh, general, you know him here, you know, when we do pressers, we have done more than 120 pressers now since the pandemic. His name is Dr. Mike Ryan. Mm. He is my excellent general and he, he is here. You are even getting a better deal. <laughs> <laughs> we can see the hand. <laughs> you see him? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> Okay. So thank you so much, and I'm really sorry to leave you, but uh, the general will take the chair and uh, will be will be with you to answer the questions. Okay, I think it you have uh, heard him many times. He's he's excellent. Okay, and an amazing so human being also. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks so much. Okay. Love thank you so thank much. You much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Carl, I will uh, get, get get in touch. I'll call you. Okay. Thank you, Tedros. Thank, thank Thanks you, again. Carl. I'm a second now. Okay. Now, um, so we, we we make the questions now. No. To take Can any questions you have, if you want to move on with your agenda, please do. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer now. Okay, you can stay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is we keep going and uh, make the questions at the end. Could it be like this? Thanks so sure. much. <laughs>
Uh, uh, your name again, please? Mike Bryan. Mike Bryan, okay. Thank you. So, our second, uh, oh, nosso segundo palestrante é o professor. Our second speaker is Professor George Rutherford. He's a physician certified in pediatrics and preventive medicine and public health. He was trained at epidemics at the CDC, a dedicated part of his professional career to public health with an emphasis on epidemiology and communicable diseases. He's the director of the Institute for Global Health, Professor uh, Faber Lucien, head of the preventive medicine and epidemiology and biostatistics and epidemiology at the University of California in San Francisco. He's also a professor of pediatrics and family medicine and community medicine, associate professor of epidemiology and administration, the School of Public Health at uh, UC Berkeley. He has had several positions in public health agencies and performed a major role in the response to COVID-19 in California. And his publications, recent publications include the coronavirus disease, will it become seasonal? And also another estimation of the effects of contact tracing and mask adoption in COVID-19 transmission in San Francisco. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to visit Brazil virtually, but I'm going to be speaking in English. And I'm going to present my first slide. Just a second. So, I always think it's sort of impolite not to speak Portuguese in Brazil. But anyway, be, be that as it may. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, delighted to present uh, what's going on in the United States and in, in California. So we have a huge mess on our hands in the United States. Uh, the cases continue to rise explosively across much of the country, and there are no signs, well, maybe a subtle sign here that we're seeing some slowing of the epidemic, but this could all just be artifact. Uh, the cases are increasing in every state except Hawaii. Uh, and uh, we've had 12.5 million cases uh, with 179,000 yesterday and uh, 257,629 deaths with more than 1,000 yesterday. And you can see here that the deaths are starting to rise uh, as well. Uh, geographically, I'll show you this in a, a second, but uh, just so you know that the largest numbers of cases have been in California, which is the largest state by a lot. California has a population of almost 40 million people. Texas, Illinois, Ohio, which is in the uh, mid Middle West, Illinois is where Chicago is, and Florida. Um, okay. So here you can see the, the map uh, here where the darkest color is, is the worst. Um, and you can see it's all spread up through this upper, through the upper uh, Midwest and the Great Plains, but also increasingly here in, uh, the, in the Southwest. This is California over here. There are a couple of counties that have a lot of cases. This is where a prison is. And this county has only has 5,000 people in it. So it's not... We're not going to worry about that too much, uh, but you can see that you know, especially down here, around uh, the kind of the metropolitan areas of Los Angeles, there has been a ton of transmission. Interestingly, uh, this has just been published by CDC. <clears throat> There's a uh, as a as uh, I heard uh, Pedro Shecker once say in Brazil, a, rural, a, rural, a ruralization, ruralization, a ruralization of cases. Uh, and cases are becoming now in this third wave, much more rural. This dark line are, are, are city cases in cities. Uh, here you can see in October, the startup. Uh, these are, uh, this dashed line is uh, you know, sort of peri-urban areas, which have really very much paralleled cities. But these lines here, these are medium-sized town cities, and these are small towns and rural areas. And you can see how it's really undergone a very, 
profound change from a disease that's primarily located in cities to one that's being increasingly, um, uh, at least on a per capita basis, uh, uh, in, uh, in rural and uh, small towns. So uh, hot spots, points of transmission in the United States include things like colleges and universities, where you've had more than uh, 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 300,000 cases, jails and prisons uh, with more than 250,000 cases in inmates. What's really important are nursing homes and long-term care facilities where we've had more than 66,000 cases and 94,000 deaths. And in fact, 37% of all deaths in the US have been in uh, residents of nursing homes. We've had large workplace outbreaks in food production facilities, especially in meat and poultry, but also in fruit canning and things like that. And then other work, uh, uh, big uh, workplaces. Interestingly, a, a large American aircraft carrier uh, had to quarantine in, on the island of Guam uh, for several weeks as a COVID epidemic went through its, uh, went through its crew but also in resorts. There's one in, Os in Las Vegas specifically, um, uh, places where ships are, uh, are built and in clothing manufacturers. This is just to give you an idea of uh, what mortality looks like in, in nursing homes. Um, this is uh, looking at, this is mortality here on the X axis. And this is the number of facilities here on the Y axis. In the US, the case fatality rate is about 2%. And here you can see in nursing homes, uh, it's something closer to 16%. So that just gives you a kind of a quantitative look at this statistic over here. Uh, interestingly, we, uh, the US is very divided on uh, the issue of wearing masks and other containment me uh, measures. Uh, this was something that was uh, recently published in the New York Times that looks at individual states. And here on the uh, x-axis are the uh, restrictiveness of uh, containment measures. So we have more restrictive and less restrictive uh, here. And then the average number of cases. And you can see this sort of, um, you know, they didn't fit a curve, but you can see the less restrictive uh, uh, public health containment measures are, the weaker they are, the more like they're, they're associated with more, uh, more cases. And these are new cases over seven days. Uh, and here's California, which has pretty strict standards down here. Hawaii, it's, you know, they have pretty strict standards, but mostly they just keep people out. Um, and then this is also looking at, um, uh, looking at people who are hospitalized for 100,000. And you can see a very similar trend with California down here and, and Hawaii down, down here. So if you don't believe case reports, you can believe hospitalizations. I always thought this was also encouraging. This is in the state of Arizona, which is just to the east of California along the Mexican border. It's where the cities of Tucson and Phoenix are. Um, so Arizona had a real um, kind of laissez-faire uh, attitude about uh, about uh, masks and other public health uh, uh, measures, and it finally got to be too much. And the governor uh, uh, issued orders to close bars, to close gymnasia, and a variety of other sites to have a shelter-in-place ordinance, and for everybody to wear masks. And you can see that. So it went on for about six weeks, and it, you can see how much the uh, cases fell during this period of time. And then they relaxed it, and now it's kind of going back up again. But this is, I think, uh, as good proof as we have that you can really turn these events around uh, with uh, very direct interventions. Um, I thought it was useful to put up some of the uh, projections. These are projections of total deaths. Uh, these are all from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle. So the current projection is that the U.S. will have had 471,000 deaths by uh, March of 1st of 2021. Um, I will say that the total U.S. casualties in World War II were 425,000. So this in the space of, at this point, about 13 months, 
will have bypassed the total number of deaths from World War II. Uh, if we have a much more, cons- you know, a, a more robust public health response with people wearing masks, it can make it somewhat lower, maybe um, 15% lower. If you have uh, 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 no uh, mandates to wear masks, to uh, have public health restrictions, it could be as uh, almost 200,000 deaths higher. So uh, just to give you an idea of the options we're dealing with uh, and un- doing so well, and then it started to go up again. Uh, this is from about the third week of October. We're currently now, uh, we had 20,000 new cases uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, this is in a state of 40 million people. So we can see if it's 40 million and we've had 1.1 million cases. Um, We've had, uh, the deaths have been somewhat lower, uh, but it looks like the deaths are starting to go up now. Uh, Again, uh, there were 56 additional deaths uh, on November, uh, uh, sorry, this would be on November 23rd, I beg your pardon. If you look where these cases are, they're in Southern California with Los Angeles County, a very large county with 11 million people in it. And then the counties that are around Los Angeles, San Bernardino, San Diego on the Mexican border at the Pacific Ocean, Orange, and Orange uh, Fico Disneyland is where Disneyland is. And Riverside, uh, these are all kind of part of the Los Angeles metropolitan area. Uh, and you can see all of them are having increases, but nothing like in Los Angeles. In response to this, uh, our governor in California uh, Governor Newsom imposed a variety of restrictions. Uh, we have a system of, of tiers uh, of different levels uh, of, uh, of restrictions, uh, and purple is the most restrictive. We currently have put 94% of the population in the purple tier, uh, which closes all sorts of things, uh, uh, and but have uh, and have also instituted, on top of that, a curfew. Uh, from where people can't be out and about from uh, 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 from 2200 to 0500 hours uh, from 2, 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, in the counties in the purple tier. That means no bars, no restaurants, no nothing uh, in these big Southern California uh, counties. Uh, San Francisco and, and Marin and San Mateo County. San Mateo is where the airport is. If anybody's been, uh, been to... Uh, to the Bay Area, uh, we're just we're kind of not quite there. But today is the day they reassign tiers, so we may well flip into the purple. Okay, so there's some good news and some bad news. The good news, I think, this is remarkably good news, is that the uh, in France, uh, after they've had their um, a period of uh, of uh, sheltering in place and uh, curfews and closing non-essential. Uh, uh, sites, they've had a big drop off in, uh, in cases. And we hope to be here in California in a couple of weeks. Interestingly, in France, everything got closed except the schools, where it's, and it's kind of the opposite in, in California, where many things are closed, uh, but especially the schools. Many things are, are, sort of, sort of, uh, are I shouldn't say closed, many things are uh, kind of partially open but the schools are totally closed. Um, and it's, you know, that's probably not the way it should be, but that's where we are. And even in the United Kingdom, in Italy, in Spain, and Germany, you're starting to see some uh, declines in cases. Hopefully that those trends will continue. The other hopeful thing um, that we're um, really interested in as we're starting to look at a real COVID surge in our hospital system in this third wave is that influenza seems to have been almost non-existent uh, in the Southern hemisphere, uh, both in um, Oceania, as well as the uh, South American cone, uh, the Southern cone. Uh, And you can see here in uh, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, New Caledonia, and uh, Papua New Guinea, that there've been almost no, uh, almost no uh, positive influenza tests uh, during these uh, during these months, and similarly in Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay, there has been there have been few, if any, uh, isolates. There is a there's also a parallel trend. There's a paper actually been published from Brazil 
that says respiratory syncytial virus uh, has also had a very low incidence over your winter. Uh, and we view these all very encouraging signs that we may not have to put up with a large influenza epidemic at the same time we're putting up with the third wave of COVID. And then finally, the other, the, this is the bad news. So on the day after tomorrow is a major American holiday called Thanksgiving, where everybody, families get together and they have uh, big dinners and, you know, lots of traditional stuff like, like turkeys and, you know, stuff, right? And it's a four day long weekend. Canada has a similar thing, but it's a month earlier. And so in Canada, and, and we're very worried about this. We don't want families getting together. We don't want households mixing together. We want people to stay in their own pod, their own household, and have small Thanksgivings. This is what happened in Canada. So here's kind of the slope pre-Thanksgiving, and this is the slope post-Thanksgiving in Canada. You can see this inflection that seems to time out at about a week after, uh, after Canadian Thanksgiving. So I think that's a real cautionary tale. So I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to answering questions. And um, falando con vocês. Thanks so much, Dr. George. Um, we we would like to know if you want to answer some questions now, or if you prefer to come back in half hour. I'm happy to. I'm happy to answer questions now. I can come back in about about 50 minutes, uh, whichever. Oh, it's great! It's great. So I'll just come back and then okay. Okay. And that way, okay. Dr. Ryan can get done sooner too. So, okay. Thanks, Thanks so much. <laughs> so, um, o nosso terceiro palestrante temos o prazer de receber. Our third speaker is Professor Walter Ricciardi from Italy. He is a physician with a PhD in public health from the University of. Naples, a full professor of hygiene and public health at, at the Catholic University in Rome, where he is also the director of the public health department, associate head of the School of Medicine. He's the current president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. And in 2011, he was the Minister of Health of Italy and named as his representative in the, for the evaluation, the Committee for the Evaluation of the National Health Service in Italy. Uh, internationally, he is a member of the European Commission expert panel on investing in health and is also a member of the National Board of Medical Examiners of the United States. And he was elected president of the European Public Health Association. Please, Dr. Ricciardi, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I try to share uh, the screen. Let's see if I am able to do that. Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, uh, I was the Italian representative uh, in the executive board of the World Health Organization when uh, the Director General Dr. Tredos came back from Beijing uh, and we had a meeting on February the 3rd. And he started to speak about his experience in Beijing and I clearly remember that at that time, of course, nobody could have suspected that a pandemia would have come. Uh, and uh, he handed the meeting, which was uh, all day long, encouraging all member states to take proportionate measures. So do not underestimate, but also do not overestimate. Uh, at that time, there were specific states that made some, I would say, overestimated uh, uh, decisions. But when I came back home, uh, at that time, there were only two Chinese tourists in Rome that were diagnosed. So everybody thought about uh, a Chinese imported syndrome. And uh, just 15 days later, uh, we had uh, a first uh, patient. And then, as you can see, from uh, uh, February the, 9th, the 20th, where the first case started and the local COVID transmission was detected, 
there was a, a dramatic increase in the, in the number of cases. Um, actually, uh, we, together with the minister, which I advise, uh, called for a meeting with uh, our neighboring countries uh, and uh, the two presidency at that time, Croatia and Germany. And I clearly remember that at that time, most of the European states thought that this was only a limited uh, situation. But in a very short time, the situation dramatically worsened in Italy. So we were obliged to take some unprecedented measures. First, lock down specific areas in the north of Italy and then to lock down the entire country. I still remember the discussion we had with other governments. Uh, they, did, they couldn't believe that we were locking down the countries, but that worked. In fact, if you can see the beginning of lockdown, the strong participation and compliance by the population brought us to a stop of mobility in the country. And uh, the, the lockdown lasted uh, two months. And uh, I would say that this saved the country. Uh, of course, we took other important, uh, important uh, uh, measures. So the first one was to create a scientific task force to provide both the government and the regions uh, with a strongly uh, evidence-based guidelines regarding the reorganization of the system and also the decision-making process. We strengthened our diagnostic testing, we reorganized our hospital network, and we started to uh, improve our surveillance system involving family doctors, pediatricians, and uh, uh, public health officers. Uh, after a talk I had with Chinese authority, authorities, we understood that was important uh, to uh, take some hotels and other properties with similar characteristics to accommodate people under medical surveillance to have intermediate care. This is the, the, the integrated surveillance system that we started. And as you can show from that time, we carefully monitored every day and every week the epidemic curve. And we also analyzed the different clinical evolution of the, uh, of the disease according to the different setting of care. Uh, we increased our testing capacity, which at the beginning was uh, scarce and also somehow biased by the first approach of testing only symptomatic patients. Then we started to test asymptomatic. But the first uh, wave of the disease was essentially located in the north of Italy. You can see that uh, the area of north of Italy was essentially the high prevalence one, while the central Italy was medium and low and the south was low and very low. And this essentially was very important because when we locked down the country, we kept the situation like this, then we reduced. And this was very worsening at that time for us because the case fatality rate for Italy was one of the highest in the world because uh, Italian population is very much biased uh, as far as concerned uh, uh, demographic distributions. Uh, we have more than 20% of our population uh, age, uh, older than 65. But uh, in particular, we studied specific situation. The country was shocked when we couldn't be able to bury all uh, deaths of the city of Bergamo. You can imagine a city of, of 60,000 inhabitants with an increase of, uh, of lethality of 567% in less than two weeks. So this really gave the country an impression. So we had to call the military to bring out the, uh, the corpse of the uh, dead people from Bergamo. But uh, we started to understand later that this particular situation was very much linked to a Champion League soccer event that happened. You must know that 40,000 people from Bergamo moved to Milan to attend uh, uh, Atalanta Valencia, which was a major uh, uh, a soccer match where Atalanta scored four and for the first time a relatively small uh, uh, town uh, uh, team had a major success. You can imagine that these 40,000 inhabitants, so essentially 60% of the population, came back home, celebrated the old day, so the increase of mortality was dramatic. So the first uh, phase was actually carefully managed by Italy but we uh, felt obliged to share our uh, lessons with the world. And so we advise uh, about the fact that Italy is a decentralized country, thus preparedness and containment may have been hampered. In fact, it's like this. So it's much better to have uh, only one chain of command of communication. 
Of course, uh, you have to take into account factors pertaining the demographics and the background disease in the population and increased burden of cases that presented themselves to the healthcare system. So this was essentially the reason why in the region Lombardy, where well, Milan is, the, uh, the outbreak spread so fast uh, because uh, at the end uh, of the day, the disease became a nosocomial infection, while the neighboring region of Veneto, where Venice is, managed pretty well and so reduced the number of cases and the fatalities in a very strong way. Italy at that time had a modest number of intensive care unit beds and very few subintensive care beds. This was the result of a budget cut in the previous five years to the austerity measures according to a financial crisis that the country experienced after 2008. And uh, this, of course, uh, has caused a serious limitation in the human resources and the hospital overcrowded may also explain the high infection rates of medical personnel, which still now. So the phase one consideration that uh, Italian data confirmed the impact of social distancing measures. So we uh, saved uh, according to uh, a, a model that we developed uh, with the, the, the full lockdown of the country, approximately 40,000 lives. And in phase two, the attention is focused on early diagnosis of cases and contact tracing. So trace, test and treat. And in particular, the attention is to intrafamily uh, uh, transmission, which is now 80% and hospital transmission that now has been minimized. So the chains of transmission should be promptly identified in order to apply isolation and quarantine. When the, from the first phase of the reopening to the second phase, we increased substantial our uh, capacity for intensive care unit beds. So we doubled them. But the centralized power of the regions made that this was achieved substantially in some regions, but was seriously underdone in other regions. And this explains uh, what I'm going to mention on the problems of the second phase. We improved the education on contact tracing for health professionals. So the National Institute of Health organized uh, a long distance uh, education for contact tracing. And we developed a national app for uh, uh, tracking uh, uh, the infected cases uh, in, in the regions. Uh, for the reopening, we were very careful. So we reopened the countries at the end of June. And at that time, for the whole uh, summertime, the situation was OK. Then we had a problem. So the second uh, wave uh, hit us as it also France, Germany, Spain, Austria, and other European countries because governments didn't react properly to the pressure given by the economic crisis and by the willingness of people to go back to a normality that cannot exist unless we have a vaccine of a specific therapeutics. Uh, in 2020, the Italian public debt is expected to increase by 10% and it will be equal to 160% of GDP. Never had this public debt before. And, uh, and of course, the other countries have a better situation, but still in problems. So I would say that in the second phase, our problem was the willingness of uh, people, particularly young people, to go uh, holidays. And uh, in fact, they went to countries such as, in particular, Spain, Croatia, Greece, and Malta that had reopened or have never closed uh, uh, dangerous places such as beaches, resorts, or discos. And uh, this brought back uh, an, a substantial number of young people. The, the, you can imagine that in August, the mean of infected people was 20, in September 30, in October 40. And then the disease spread all around the country via family transition. So the lesson that we learn is that the health sectors need to be supported, deserves to be at the heart of recovery post-COVID-19. Health systems need to use the current circumstances to learn lessons and strengthen health system going forward. But COVID-19 has also served to highlight the burden of non-communicable disease since people with chronic conditions were more likely to suffer disability or die from COVID-19. And the priority now is to be given to the mental pandemic. So the priority to mental health and to the digital transformation because the health sector will be revolutionized through the impact of technology in the coming years. So we need to ensure that the elderly and those with lower levels of digital literacy are not excluded. But the most important lesson is that when we supported our decision with science, governmental decisions were effective. When this was somehow relaxed 
or there was a complacency by the government to lobby this pressure or to pressure by local politicians, uh, then we had a problem. So investment in research is needed on an ongoing basis in order to enable us to tackle some of the pervasive problems affecting health and well-being. But also we, as physicians, as scientists, as epidemiologists, as public health people, have to engage in discussing with politicians and making them able to take the best possible decisions in the shortest possible times. This is a challenge for everybody, and I guess it's a challenge for Brazilian colleagues as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Valtimir Chad. A wonderful presentation and for being here with us. Uh, o nosso quarto palestrante. Our fourth speaker is Dr. Claudio Mayerovich. He is a physician, graduated from the University of Sao Paulo. He's a specialist in hospital administration, health service administration, has a master's in preventive medicine from the School of Medicine in Sao Paulo, is the director and president and associate director of the National Health Surveillance Agency in two different administrations. He was the director of communicable diseases in the Ministry of Health. He is one of the main authorities involved in tackling uh, Zika virus disease and more recently COVID-19. Dr. Claudio Mayerovich has vast experience in health surveillance, both epidemiological and health surveillance. He has provided great services to Brazilian societies and several different endemics and pandemics and epidemics in our country and also Abrasco in tackling the COVID-19 epidemic. Dr. Claudio Mayerovich, you have the floor. You may proceed. Good afternoon, one and all. Thank you for the kind and rather overdone, over kindly introduction. I want to thank the Brazilian Association of Collective Health and my greetings to Dr. Mike Ryan, Walter Richard, and Dr. George Rutherford. I want to discuss surveillance, not the response as a whole, or the epidemiological scenario in Brazil. So I'm going to be discussing here a little bit, giving a few international examples. I'm not going to discuss all of the international examples to try to glimpse some characteristics and some patterns amongst the responses to the epidemic, which are not single patterns or necessarily stereotyped patterns, but it's a mixture of patterns and standards based on the distribution of these responses by the different countries and the times in the pandemic. And then we're gonna go into a little bit of the situation in Brazil of the Brazilian, initial Brazilian response and what's happened since then and the time that we are experiencing today. So from the beginning, we had various different experiences. I avoid speaking about positive and negative experiences. I think each of them has gives us lessons to learn. The first thing that merits quoting, I think it's the, has the greatest impact which still awakens a lot of questions is the Chinese experience. China had the amazing speed ever since the detection of the cases, which apparently began to occur in November, December in 2019. And in a short space of time, in less than a month, they realized that something different was happening there. This might sound rather banal, but since we have respiratory diseases and severe respiratory diseases is something that happens commonly in our health systems, it's not always the case that people realize at first glance that there is a respiratory disease that is not uh, followed the same patterns. This happened in December already last year. and. In a very short space of time, China succeeded in identifying the etiological agent. The Chinese scientists were very competent in this sense and do the genetic sequencing of this new etiological agents, agent, agent identified as a novel coronavirus. This sequencing was made available to the world for the response that followed. China amazed us. And, over impressed us first because of the scenes that we saw. It was unbelievable. It, it seemed to be distant and remote from us. Even for people in the business of epidemiological surveillance, it appeared like something from another world, another planet. 
we've just lost okay it was extremely it had a huge impact and the chinese government took drastic major measures and beginning with isolation of the province of wuhan and hubei rather where the city of wuhan is located in the province of hubei and that's a large city and a metropolis by our standards so isolation of the province of hubei and the cities inside hubei province this meant closing down airports closing down railways and uh, highways we saw scenes where parts of the highways were destroyed by machines to prevent uh, people from traveling over the roads a curfew people were forced to stay at home and very quickly they assembled a hospital structure that was heavily focused on pe people's isolation to identify cases quickly in uh, such that the, they contained to a certain extent the transmission after which they did mass testing and this chinese province and the cities in this province were literally locked down in terms of activity in a very rigorous way at that time and all of this was successful and the country was successful in containing internal domestic transmission but this was not capable of preventing the foreign transmission because probably it had already begun even before they detected the novel coronavirus china since then has been as impressed as at a very low level of transmission thanks to rigorous measures as soon as any sign there's a testing program on an extremely broad scale any suspected case that's been identified this has meant the adoption of lockdowns local lockdowns and isolation of on expanded scales based on the identification of cases and they proceeded with a strategy of sensitive detection and broad de testing isolation of individuals he has just turned off his microphone dr mayorovich just turned off his microphone You need to turn your microphone back on, Claudio, Dr. Mayerovich. You've switched your microphone off. Sorry, I touched, I turned off my microphone inadvertently. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. So, okay. The neighboring countries, the Asian countries, had their first, the first countries to be affected. One of the examples that we always quote, which I want to mention, is that of South Korea. Also, uh, how amazing it is and was and still is, it's still an example of a positive response. Let's recall South Korea had a previous experience with a large outbreak of MERS coffee and uh, Middle East coronavirus at the time. They prepared, they developed a protocol, specific protocols relating to the possibility of transmission and expansion of a respiratory or an airborne disease, which uh, happened precisely at this second moment. North Korea initially started starting with the identification of the first cases uh, there's its protocols which already began for the adaptation of these protocols uh, strategies for containment and restriction of circulation of people and s encouraging self-isolation this is a cultural characteristic of korea uh, high educational level where approximately 70 percent of the young people 25 to 35 years of age have a university education just to cite an example, it's the country that has the highest internet speed, four times more than a middle-sized city in the United States. And in this local culture in Korea, there is a credibility in the system, in the 
guidelines issued by the government's high adherence to containment measures and the mask use Korea very quickly managed to call companies that produced tests. So in just a few days, they had a first company already had a test ready to offer. And they began to offer tests on a huge scale with the expansion of several different dozens of testing centers all across the country. And a major portion of these and is drive-through format. So the health workers weren't exposed to possible uh, transmission in the testing sites. Korea mobilized a law at the time, which the control and prevention of infectious diseases at the time of the MERS outbreak. It was the possibility of mobilizing broad tracing, electronic tracing of confirmed cases. And this is something which we discussed extensively how much this meant a kind of invasion of privacy for, by our standards. It would mean invasion of privacy, but it's an option by that country, given the previous threat from MERS. So G, solid GPS, credit card data, data on from cameras, surveillance cameras with image identification, they used widely by the government. These were all used for identification tracing of contacts in this law provided for information de-identified information from this being made available to the population, de-identified data so people could consult if they had a probable contact with cases and they can con also consult on the hot spots for transmission based on the analysis generated from data, aggregate data analysis. Amongst other examples, also Taiwan succeeded in achieving effective control based on the early cases. Taiwan, similar to Korea, had its own plan developed because of MERS, rather not MERS because of the expansion of SARS in 2003 and 2004. So that it was a complete plan based on their experience with SARS in 2003 and 2004 and border control as well, recalling that since it is a island country like other examples of good control this is a task that is facilitated by the fact that they're island nations and there are several other good examples of control that were efficacious in asia like hong kong singapore japan cambodia thailand laos vietnam and all of them based on the intensive use of technologies and testing broad testing and measures which if they didn't function in some countries because of their culture by convincing they were backed by punitive measures and especially the application of heavy fines for people who failed to comply with the rulings and the guidelines for uh, social isolation and lockdown and activities there were other examples which adopted strategies that were similar but not as intense as in china this occurred in the middle east examples like tunisia morocco and chad other countries that continued and succeeded and giving good examples that succeeded in containment and closing borders and a restriction on tourist activities especially the case of the caribbean barbados dominica cuba and with surveillance strategies combined with closing of borders. In Oceania, the Nova, New Zealand is adopted a strategy for rigorous border control with quarantine, rapid detection, and rapid testing and broad testing as well, based on the identification of any positive case. In Europe, we had some examples like Montenegro, Croatia and Iceland. Iceland is an island country, but we had Germany as the largest population in Europe, which was also successful in rapidly producing tests, mass testing and screening and tracing of suspected cases and succeeded in 
achieving some of the best results in Europe and amongst the countries of the so-called first wave of the expansion of the disease. We had examples of countries which had important problems as well. Italy was mentioned just now by our colleague Ricciardi paid the price for being the first country with rapid expansion of the disease in its territory at a time of difficulties to understand the real meaning and the mechanisms for transmission and expansion of this disease, as was already discussed here, the example of the young people, but other uh, like the football matches. And it was a, there were countries that had problems with this because of uh, political disagreement between the central government, uh, local governments, which decided to stay open and, and a lot of controversy with economic forces inside the countries after this it was followed as in some other examples by protests by large contingents of the population against lockdowns and confinement and economic losses and this produced problems for the Italian response. The UK was an example of a country which denied the existence of the epidemic at the beginning, although this stance changed afterwards, but apparently it was already too late to be able to achieve a re significant reversal in the trend that the disease had already taken on in the UK. Sweden has also been identified as one of the countries which opted initially, and this was the official discourse in Sweden by the specialists in charge of tackling the disease in Sweden, they chose to take a path which they thought was possible that the disease would expand and reach a first the less vulnerable people and the most vulnerable people would be protected and affecting spontaneously some kind of herd immunity this proved impossible and the harms were huge in terms of human losses and the economy as well. So there were major containment measures which were not even published properly, suspending a lot of activities and isolation of bars and restaurants and by the population as well. Somewhat later, the United States became the worst example in the world of control of COVID-19 with virtually non-existent controls and Brazil followed the same example following parallel curves to the United States with a lag of several weeks and with some proportion with regard to the numbers. Even today, this is still happening with the two countries with a major share of transmission and the diseases impact on the Americas, recalling that the American continent today has more than 50% of the cases and deaths in the world. In the Americas, Brazil entered this scenario somewhat later than the others. It had some time to prepare and Brazil had a theoretical prior preparation that we have a unified health system, which means the population has universal free access to the services for a diagnosis and treatment and performing tests. Theoretically, at least Brazil especially has a health system which is extremely capillary in primary health care when specifically the family health strategy, the health surveillance structure and also is well structured in the tra traditional and well tested in several different challenges, including epidemics, which the country has faced and tackled. This structure includes the control of transmission in health care establishments, which is one of the things that has worked reasonably well. And Brazil has a sentinel surveillance for respiratory diseases, specifically influenza, which means that the monitoring of flu syndromes and respiratory, acute respiratory syndromes hospitalized in Brazil and deaths due to severe acute respiratory infection. This is a system that allows us to have approximately 97% or almost all of the 
Severe acute respiratory infections can be attributed to coronavirus during this current period. This could have worked. This linkage of these systems could have worked, and our advance warning could have worked as a an effective response by Brazil as a country. With previous experiences, we had a culture of the unified health system, the SUS, a culture of public health in Brazil as important heritage in the country's response to threats, to health threats. So Brazil attempted, based on previous experiences and the contingency plan itself for the influenza, which already existed, to respond to coronavirus, to the novel coronavirus. But uh, the premises would be have a unified action, unified intersector action based on science and with uh, the federal uh, government leading the way, both in adopting the necessary actions and clear communication to the population. This would be one of the first premises in general for an effective response. Nevertheless, this culture was sabotaged by the leaders, the government leaders themselves. So the great Brazil's great public health heritage to respond to the crisis was sabotaged and undermined to the extent that the response was limited virtually to not that it was nothing, but it was almost uh, to treating cases. It was limited to that. There was some organization also capable of responding to high complexity treatment in hospitals in the ICUs, although uh, it was there was an overload. The most recent case was in Manaus, but also state capitals in Northeast and Rio de Janeiro as well at certain stages. But this represented the investment that the country had made to respond to the crisis. And it was virtually the only investment that was made. We did not have a, an investment in response to our main heritage, which was primary health care and even health surveillance itself. So the country doesn't have a plan. On the contrary, if somebody studies this someday, if they observe it from outside, they could say that Brazil had a counter plan almost because uh, at the same time that some authorities were talking about confinement and isolation, mask wearing, the top authority in the country told people to go out on the streets to keep their businesses open, to not use masks, and saying that that was just a simple cold or something that would not uh, have major uh, repercussions on the country. So this was the main problem and it persists to this day marked heavily by the interruption of the initial response by the Ministry of Health as the commander of the system at the beginning whose leadership was switched twice. The Minister of Health, the two past Ministers of Health who were fired at the beginning of the crisis. And we have a substitute interim minister for four months and then he was named as a permanent minister. And he has absolutely no experience. He didn't even know what the unified health system was. He only heard about it after he'd been named the Minister of Health and he has absolutely no ex prior experience in dealing with the system or with epidemics, pandemics, or health threats in general, public health threats. Fortunately, we had some examples scattered across the countries of good responses at the initial moment, some responses, state level responses and containment and restriction of activities, economic activities, which allowed to reduce and flatten the pace of the curve and incidents in the country and municipal examples, some of the most widely cited ones are the examples of Araraquara, Florianópolis, Niterói, the state of Maranhão and the state of Ceará, who succeeded a certain extent of control doing what was already in the part of our unified health system and our epidemiological surveillance and health surveillance in the country. In other words, open the doors to the population with adequate biosafety measures, test people, test, isolate cases, trace contacts, and quarantine, supervised quarantine at these contacts. So we had some positive indicators from these initiatives at the state and municipal levels, which may still serve as inspiration to us for an effective national response, which we still need. It will never be too late to begin a national response, amongst other reasons, because we don't have another alternative. There's no alternative as long as we don't have a vaccine in the system. 
is organized to vaccinate the entire population, except focusing our attention on the response, which depends on primary health care, broad testing, and health surveillance linked to these two uh, previous factors. So it's now a matter of us resuming the principles of health surveillance. I say this with some skepticism because I see no leadership in this country capable of doing this. So I think it's obligation to reaffirm this as Abrasco, the Brazilian Association of Collective Health has been doing with it, publishing its contingency plan as a call to arms for the government. Uh, to adopt it as its own plan, even considering the vaccine on the horizon, we need a health surveillance system and primary health care, which are organized to act immediately and to act at the time of the vaccine as well. It's um, unthinkable to have vaccination as a single containment strategy for the pandemic unless it is associated with a health surveillance strategy as well, which provides for blockades local blockades in areas which concentrate the expansion of cases in order for the initial impact of the vaccination, which will have a limited number initially in Brazil for it to be as large as possible because protecting the more vulnerable populations but protecting the places where the virus is spreading most quickly. Just by way of recalling now at this moment and thinking of our similarity with the profile of the United States, Canada was an example of the United States or have Thanksgiving the day after tomorrow because of our lag. We'll have a situation, a very similar situation in Christmas in a month and a few days time. And it's extremely important for us to be able to act before Christmas to communicate clear messages to the populations. And it would be desirable for us to have clear leadership in this process. Unfortunately, we haven't, we won't have before Christmas to at least uh, trace out uh, some responses so summarizing, we had characteristics of symptom systems that responded well because they organized health systems with clear leadership, which were uh, unified in their messages to the population because there was speed in their response with technologies like testing and contact tracing and broad use of communication between governments, policymakers, specialists, and society as a whole. So unfortunately, we aren't in a time of optimism here in Brazil. We hope to have a better response in the future and we can have a message of reinforcing what had been oriented before and the need for a national plan and with a clear unified response for the country to this pandemic. So thank you very much, and I'm available for the debate period. Thank you very much, Claudio, for your contribution to the discussion. So we'll turn the floor over to the last speaker, who is Professor Gulnar Azevedo Silva, who is a physician, public health physician with a master's in collective health from the U State University of Rio, a PhD in, or a doctor medicine from the University of Sao Paulo, the coordinator of prevention at the National Cancer Institute from 2003 to 2007. She's a full professor at the Institute of Social Medicine, at the State University of Rio. She does research in epidemiology and chronic non-communicable diseases with an emphasis on epidemiologic applied to uh, cancer control policies. And she is a full researcher in the new state uh, she's part of the steering committee of the global program for s cancer survival led by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. In 2008, she was elected president of the Brazilian Association of Collective Health, Abrasco. Galnar is a colleague and friend of ours for years. She's the current president of Abrasco, and she has played an historical role in this institution in confronting COVID-19 day and night tirelessly coordinating the program open up Abrasco where special programs were promoted to discuss the main aspects of COVID-19 uh, from its breadth 
un inequalities in the country, the most vulnerable groups and policies for tackling these problems you presented, represented in the elaboration of the uh, COVID-19 plan in response to the total lack of leaderships from the federal government. Uh, which was cited by Dr. Claudio Mayerovic on behalf of the researchers in collective health and uh, epidemiologists of Brazil. Thank you for your important role that you've played in uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic in Brazil. You have the floor, Galnar Azevedo. Thank you very much, Lisa. Good afternoon, one and all. One and all. Thank you very much, Lisa and Claudio. I would also like to thank Dr. Tedros. Dr. Mike Ryan, Dr. Walter Hichardi, Dr. Rutherford, and it's great to see the beginning of this, our Congress of Epidemiology, which unfortunately cannot be held in person. It was postponed until next year, but this debate cycle is to celebrate what would have been the year, which would have been the year of our Congress, the long-awaited Congress in Epidemiology. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking about collective health here. I'm gonna be skimming over what I, want to show you all and it is can you see me now the picture this was in i'm going to be talking about the role of collective health can you see it okay this was our last congress of abrasco which happened in july 2018 the general assembly of abrasco more than 6,000 people attended this encourages us we have our scientific society and collective health but our role is truly to contribute to education and to training people to act in collective health amongst all the needs that our brazilian population faces in health so what i want to comment here is to talk about something it's rather dated. We began with the news that in Brazil on February 26th, we had confirmed the first case of the novel coronavirus, several headlines. And on March 25th, we heard the speech by President Bolsonaro saying that coronavirus is an attempt to demobilize society and the health authorities and the state health secretaries this speech was called the speech of death which was overlooking the disease making fun of COVID-19 as COVID was spreading in Brazil he made the speech of death we sent a letter which was signed by all this long list of health associations that was distributed on the same evening we drafted this letter and talking about Bolsonaro the enemy we called him Bolsonaro the enemy of the people's health this was on March 25th, the same day he gave his speech of death. We continued working in the sense of raising topics related to COVID-19, but it was important for us as a scientific association, public health, collective health, together with other researchers and associations from the area, especially researchers from Brazil, to bring to the debate and expand the information on COVID-19. So on April 7, it was our first debate first panel discussion which occurred as was cited by Lisa in Abrasco with the former president of Abrasco and other colleagues who work and have for years in collective health in Brazil and these 32 years since we've existed and the, the unified health system has existed by everything that has been done to build the health system so it's been decades almost 40 years struggling for the unified universal health system and so the SUS this is the second year this Leisure is here and Claudia were here this is the second debate that by our panel discussion Nebraska remote discussion and we're still holding these debates these panel discussions and including we brought the discussion with the people who have worked and administrators the governor of the state of Maranhão and here the governor or the the mayor of the city of Manaus and researchers to talk about the situation, but the attempt by Abrasco together with other uh, civil societies in Brazil it was to expand this debate. That was our intent and expand it to other areas besides health. We did 
a lot of research work and this was the study which i found most important we asked the ministry of health demanding that the ministry of health publish information on race and color in the information systems on covid 19 because we know that risk is high for everyone but it's much higher for the black population and for the vulnerable populations and we call attention to this and we were successful in having included the race color variable in the case reporting on COVID-19. This with the support of the Black Brazilian movement. These are events that we continued holding these forums. We did demonstrations in solidarity with the health workers. Many of them have died because we're in the front line treating patients with COVID-19. On May 29, we launched together with other collective health organizations, the various different civil society organizations, the National Health Council and other organizations, and the Brazilian Society for the Advancement of Science. We launched uh, the movement, which to this day we consider extremely important and it needs to be expanded, which is the launch of the Front for Life. And this uh, day was the day we launched this Front for Life. We had huge participation. More than 600 associations joined this front, the March for Life, which was held on June 9th here just to show the March for Life, many people sent videos. And why I mean to say is that we had broad participation by in social movements in the sense of uh, raising what has already been discussed in this panel discussion, the importance of science and following science and clear communication for the population of what was happening on June 9. And we continued with this on, we found that in addition to mobilizing since there was omission, total omission by the federal government, and uh, not only omission, but uh, disservice, communicating false, fake news, and underestimating the pandemic. On July 3rd, we held a national and started a national plan for confronting the COVID-19 pandemic with three plus the National Health Council and several different civil society organizations. We distributed this plan on that day, the day that the plan was launched, and we delivered it to multiple movements and society in general. We delivered it later to the National Congress and the Ministry of Health. And here are the organizations that participated in drafting this plan. Many associations from the health field participated in this plan. We called to responsibility and we made recommendations to political authorities, the health authorities, uh society in general and policymakers it's important that we called attention to the need for an integrated plan linked to at the federal state and municipal levels and the plan which would ensure work employment and income for people to be able to continue to adopt the social isolation measures as should be proposed and followed on august 8 we held the event, 100,000 deaths from COVID-19 in Brazil, we reached 100,000 deaths. This milestone on October 11, 150,000 deaths, and we can still talking in October 20, we issued a letter on our position concerning the vaccines, which is necessary to vaccinate the entire population and, and the orders and priorities for access to the vaccine. We did this. We also held on November 17, just now we launched a new version of the Joint Manifesto on Education and Health. It was a fundamental step, uh, step together with the entire field of education because we believe that working on the issue of the pandemic, uh, what about education? It's essential, it's crucial for us to think together, health organizations, education as well. And we built this plan, which was launched a version of this manifesto on November 17, and it has been widely discussed in the education sector. We expanded this. In other words, we not only have it in the health field, but we're working together with education precisely because of the things that were stated there and the importance of not failing to treat our population and leave our population outside of schools and the role of education. But we need to protect teachers and students and their families. And then this Friday, this Friday, understanding that the situation has been exacerbated and the number of cases has increased in several places in Brazil. And this really concerns us. We can have uh, simultaneously an exacerbation of this health crisis and the number of deaths increasing the health system uh, can enter into collapse. We 
issued a warning letter to the political and health authorities in Brazil. This was on this last Friday. So I mean to say that we continue our with our role as a collective health association. We continue to play our role, calling all of our partners to arms. And we have great unity in the front for life with all the collective health associations. And we need to have the population understand this and to demand of the state that has been discussed here, the state's duty in the pandemic. On November 23rd, Obrasco did this issue showing the summer coming here in Brazil and the beaches and the situation, which we have absolutely no guarantee that this fight is being waged within the scientific parameters and which in within which can be done and strengthening the unified health system. Brazil needs the unified health system, the SUS. So I want to conclude. Uh, to leave time for the debate. This was our Congress, the 8th Congress of Abrasco in Social Science and Human Sciences and Health, which occurred, it was last year in João Pessoa in 2019. And this brings us hope that this march that occurred in João Pessoa last year in the Northeast of Brazil, it was a march, a beautiful march, which said that the important thing is health for all. It's important for us to have a strengthened unified health system to front and I was part of this march myself. The most of the people here had hope, but most of the people here understood the role of young people and the role of health workers, and the role of understanding that inequality in Brazil will only be solved or mitigated if we have unity, if we can march together. And this march for me is a great example of this. We need to continue strong and uh, resolute to confront this pandemic because we have major human capital which understands and they're with us in this struggle so i want to stop right here and leave time for you all for the debate and to pass the floor back over to Lisa for her to conduct the debate so thank you very much thank you Golnar, for your words of hope for all of us we need to have hope we have several questions here they are three questions for the World Health Organization. Dr. Mike Ryan. Are you still there, Dr. Ryan? Sorry, yes, I am turning my video back on. I, I just have to change location. <laughs> so I have three questions for you. I'm going to say in Portuguese uh, because we have a translation, okay? Um, from, they're asking, why did it take so long for the WHO to warn the world population about COVID-19? How many vaccines, the production after years of research, now it's a shorter uh, turnaround time with the vaccine. Is that feasible? We have other questions here. Roberto de Freitas, after proving the safety and efficacy, uh, is there some commitment for the companies to deliver COVAX to COVAX rather than to some countries that pay or have, may have already paid for the vaccine. And the last, Araujo, what is the position by the WHO concerning the recent results of the AstraZeneca vaccine? The ideal would, thing would be to repeat phase three with the first uh, dose half a half dose is the initial dose of the vaccine. That's that Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So you have the floor now, Dr. Ryan. Um, uh, great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry I'm not joined this evening by uh, Mary Angela Simao, who's your wonderful country person and our assistant director general here at WHO, because Angela could probably, Mary Angela could answer the last couple of questions much better than I. And uh, <laughs> The fact that we have uh, COVAX, and more importantly, the fact that we have an agreed allocation framework is very much down to the work that Anne Marie Angela has led on fair and equitable allocation of the vaccine through the COVAX initiative. Um, it's, it's really powerful statements that so many countries covering more than 18, 90% of the world's population have joined in the COVAX initiative. Um, and there is an allocation framework that will allow all countries to access vaccine. The, 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 the challenge in that is going to be getting adequate funding for the ACT Accelerator and for the COVAX initiative. 
uh, and you'll have heard Dr. Tedros speak on this on many occasions over the last uh, number of days, including at the G20, and calling on all countries, especially the wealthier countries, to invest in COVAX and ensure that there's adequate funding. The barrier now to vaccine vaccination, as opposed to having vaccines, is twofold. One is the funds to be able to purchase enough vaccine to distribute it according to the allocation framework. And second is making countries ready to be able to deliver that vaccine. Because uh, vaccine is, is one uh, issue and we'll solve the efficacy issue. And I'll speak about efficacy in a minute. But effectiveness of vaccination is more than just the vaccine. It's about creating demand in the population for the vaccine and being able to deliver that vaccine to those who want it especially given some of the logistic constraints with the low temperature needed for some of the vaccines. Um, and that's a major, a major challenge we face now. As has been stated before, uh, someone, uh, we've, WHO has likened this to reaching the base camp of Everest. We've reached base camp, but now we need to climb the mountain. Uh, and that mountain is around fair allocation. That mountain is around funding. And that mountain is around vaccine, vaccination readiness at government level and vaccine demand from the population. And there are four separate issues there that need to be resolved if we're going to have successful vaccination. With regard to the, uh, the number of vaccines and trials, clearly we have results or preliminary results from three trials, which are extremely promising. Uh, WHO had set minimum um, uh, efficacy at 50%, where the lower bound of confidence should not be below 30%. The three, three trials so far have far exceeded that basic minimum requirement. So this is good. Um, the high vaccine efficacy from the mRNA vaccines is very promising. But as you know, they have low temperature requirements for transport. And there may be issues in large scale production. It may take time. This is a new platform in terms of production. Uh, the good news from the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is that uh, while the vaccine may have demonstrated, uh, at least for now, lower efficacy. The fact is that the vaccine is relatively much potentially more, more affordable and secondly is producible in much larger volumes in a shorter period of time. So we may have much more vaccine. So in effect it represents a real option for vaccination uh, particularly in situations where we want to keep the costs uh, low and the volumes high. Um, the interesting, uh, it's an interesting point made by one of the commentators <clears throat> regarding the results of the AstraZeneca trial. We still have to see the, the actual raw data. Mary Angela and the regulatory team are looking forward to receiving that data to understand fully because the AstraZeneca trial was carried out in many countries with many sort of uh, a, a number of different uh, objectives or sub-trials within the trial. And yes, you're right. The highest efficacy seems to have come from a half dose followed a month later by a full dose. Uh, there are many more people online that are more expert vaccinologists than me. Uh, it seems in some sense counterintuitive that a full dose followed by a full dose resulted in lower efficacy than a half dose followed by a full dose. Uh, but that could be somewhat explained by uh, non-interference on the second dose. The fact that the first dose is a prime dose and then the second dose uh, has a big impact because the effect of the first dose, in a sense, uh, is it's not there's no interference between or less interference between the two doses so it's not uh, inexplicable at all um, the idea of expanding the half dose uh, full dose regimen and including more people in that arm of the trial I, I, I just don't have the answer for you we'll have to check with our colleagues in Oxford and AstraZeneca as to whether they in, in, intend to enroll more patients on that arm of the trial um, whatever the case, I believe we have uh, an effective uh, a vaccine that is demonstrating promising uh, efficacy. Um, with regard to the, the work that's been done over the last year, it is remarkable within, uh, we're 10 months out, uh, 11, nearly 11 months out from the first detection of, of this as a public health concern. Uh, there's, you know, we would have had in late January, early February, the, the research and development roadmap and all of the researchers in the world came together uh, under the auspices of WHO on the Research and Development Blueprint for epidemics and laid out what the R&D roadmap would be for the necessary drugs and vaccines and therapeutics. So in a sense, we were ahead of the game because for a couple of years previously, we had laid out through the R&D Blueprint the 10 top diseases for which we needed solutions, including disease X. 
So many of the target product profiles and many of the issues around what we would need in this situation had been clearly elucidated. So the companies and the researchers had a head start uh, and clear guidance on what we should be looking at developing. Uh, it is to the great credit of having CEPI uh, already in place, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiatives, which was allowed immediate investment through the CEPI initiative in targeted vaccine development. We had similar investments from the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other vaccines. And then obviously national governments investing in companies to, to, do, to, to, to do advanced work on developing vaccines. It's probably, it has been without question the fastest global collaborative effort in history to develop countermeasures or vaccines against an unknown pathogen. And for that, the scientific community, both the academic, the public and the private sector should take a bow because uh, they have done remarkable work in, in bringing forward so many different candidates. There are further candidates, at least uh, another, I think, eight or nine in phase three clinical trials, and there are uh, up to 50 more in clinical trials phase, uh, phase one and two, and other candidates currently under development. And we would like to encourage that, those, uh, re that the research on those other candidates continue. We're not going to get through this with just one vaccine both from the perspective and uh, we, we will be looking for enhancements currently. We're on a two-dose regimen for all the vaccines, two of them requiring ultra-cold. We may find other vaccines that give us one-dose solutions or give us uh, better solutions in terms of price or better solutions in terms of logistics um, and also in terms of production. So I think we want to encourage all the researchers who are currently working on vaccines to continue and to continue to do the research needed to bring more vaccines uh, it will also create a healthier market that will also drive down prices and increase availability at the same time. And again, we'd like to commend Brazilian researchers who've been absolutely central to many of the studies that are currently underway, uh, both the academic and, 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 and the government side, for, for taking the lead on the research and the operational research and the trials that are needed to uh, deliver uh, on these vaccines. With regard to the, the uh, early part uh, of the epidemic or pandemic, uh, WHO uh, first alerted the world on January 4th and then in detail on January 5th as to the threat associated with this new pathogen. That was before it had been even identified uh, clearly as a, as a new coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we were already uh, by uh, the, the vaccine se or the virus sequences were uploaded on January 10th and 11th. And by January 14th, WHO was already distributing laboratory assays and working with companies. And uh, by uh, the third week of January, we had already engaged with companies on, uh, uh, on a company with the uh, academic unit and a company in Germany on the production of PCR-based tests. So WHO uh, uh, alerted the world um, uh, as soon as we had detected the problem and verified that the problem existed. Uh, we had a first uh, emergency committee on January 22nd and the committee, the external independent committee at that time felt that the disease had not reached the criteria of being a public health, a global public health emergency. Subsequent to that, uh, Dr. Tedros and myself traveled to China to fully uh, understand the situation on the ground there. And on our direct return to Geneva, uh, convened uh, another meeting of the emergency committee. And on the 30th of January, the disease was declared a public health emergency a global public health emergency or a fake, a public health emergency of international concern, which is the highest level of alert that, uh, that WHO can declare. So uh, we believe that uh, WHO um, had uh, tried uh, our very best to both uh, collect the data, understand the problem uh, and alert the world. Um, and uh, obviously then have continued to raise the alarm regarding uh, this uh, very, very uh, serious disease and situation. So uh, I'm sure we can debate how we can improve all aspects of early warning, early detection, alert, and many of the things right the way through this pandemic. But uh, from, from our perspective, that is how the, the pandemic uh, unfolded. Our first uh, detection of this from WHO's perspective was on the 31st of December. Um, uh, now, we're working with Chinese authorities to look at the early part of the pandemic and, 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 and looking at earlier epidemiologic studies to establish just where and when uh, the disease emerged into humans. The Wuhan seafood market was clearly a cluster that was detected in association with that market because of the 
unusual respiratory disease, the cluster of atypical pneumonias, where a number of those cases were associated with the market, but a number of the cases also were not associated with that market. So it's very likely that the breach of the species barrier occurred either on multiple occasions or at least occurred before uh, that cluster that was associated with the Wuhan market. So we still need to understand case zero or case zeros and the specific breach of the animal human species barrier that occurred. So much more work needs to be done on that side. And clearly, um, many countries uh, have found it difficult to react and respond to contain and mitigate this disease because the levels of preparedness around the world and awareness uh, were less than they should be. But, uh, but also, um, some countries just, just did not take that threat seriously. Uh, and uh, a lot of time was lost uh, in the period of February and March and April uh, for some countries in, in recognizing that we were facing uh, a major uh, problem and putting in place the necessary surveillance, containment and uh, quarantine measures. We're all learning. Everyone has been uh, challenged and stressed uh, by, this, uh, by this situation. But I do believe that overall, the, the collective solidarity globally, the scientific collaboration globally, uh, and the work we've all done together gives us hope now that we can uh, finally bring this disease under control. Uh, at this point, it's difficult to speak about eradicating or eliminating this virus. Uh, the, the high vaccine efficacy gives us a real chance, which you've also seen uh, from the data that you've seen from mink and, and uh, infections in animals like that, that other animals can be infected with the human virus. So we also have to look at how we can ensure that eradication is possible when the disease can slip back into animal populations and potentially back into humans. But I do believe we should have a strong objective of control, potentially elimination, and if we get the opportunity to eradicate this virus. But that's going to take a huge amount of work, especially in the vaccination area, and I think most importantly, I would, the message I would have tonight or today for you in the afternoon in Brazil is we have got to keep up public health response. We have got to keep up testing, uh, isolation of cases, treatment of cases, identification of contacts, quarantine of contacts, and the mitigation measures. The vaccine is a, is a huge addition to the algebra of bringing COVID to zero. If we want COVID to equal zero, we cannot just bring vaccine. Vaccine does not equal zero. Control measures, continued public vigilance, add in vaccine, and then we have a real opportunity to get this virus under control and potentially even to get to zero. Back to you. Thank you so much for your important words for us. Uh, some more questions is, qual Thais pergunta, Thais is asking, what's your opinion regarding the schools reopening? Following safety protocols, is it possible to return for schools to reopen? Other questions? Denise Pimenta, I would like to hear Dr. Claudio Mayerovich a little bit about the African countries. And the, well, the continent, the continent was supposed to be devastated, but it didn't happen. Why not? considering this is Pimenta Marcial, that 2020 was the year of municipal elections in Brazil, and many of the mayors were re-elected. The federal government lost its epidemiological power. It's rather strange, but I think we can understand what she meant. The federal government lost the, most of the mayor's races and the behavior of COVID-19 in the African countries. Another question about African countries, similar ones. What's the explanation for Africa not having been devastated and, and African countries weren't devastated by? So the question is open to you all. I think several of our researchers can answer that those questions. Uh, reopening schools, that was the first question with safety missions in Africa. What happened in Africa? Why the pandemic hasn't spread this? And what could have happened? What could have happened if the federal government lost its power because of the municipal elections? I can talk about Brazil. We've worked with regard to the opening of the schools, and then we can hear the experience of colleagues from about the other countries. As I showed, we in collective health, together with several different people from the education field, we began to build a manifesto precisely 
evaluating this point in the title of the manifesto is occupy schools protect and value education why because we believe at this moment brazil is experiencing months of pandemic and the schools especially the closed public schools which increases inequality in the country and we believe that education is not simply to recover content education has to work with organization and structuring and it's extremely important precisely in places where the families have more difficulty and they're more exposed to the risks not only direct and indirect effects of the pandemic so this manifesto is a manifesto which calls on teachers and educational associations together with health associations to be able to build proposals to protect and organize and structure the return to classes, the reopening of schools, understanding education as we conceive education, full education, education that could even help our population, poorer population and the more vulnerable population to confront this problem. So this manifesto is already being discussed. It's been launched already and we have contact with and had a lot of support. The main problem again, I say is the lack of a plan both in education and in health at the federal government level which could bring all the issues to the table and to work in an integrated fashion on all of these channels that our country is facing with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. Claudio has also participated. I don't know if you would like to add to that the issue of education. Claudio Mayerovich could comment on this and on the municipalities after which we'll conclude with Walter Richard, Jared Rutherford um, about the schools in the United States and Italy, their opinion about reopening schools there. Uh, do I have the floor? Yes. Uh, what about the municipalities? A little bit more about the reopening the schools and if the federal government has lost she called it the epidemiological power. We call it because the results of the recent municipal elections. The federal administration lost a lot of support from municipalities. I think uh, we're, the discussion of the schools, it's not a simple question, reopening schools. We are faced with a dilemma. It's difficult to escape the dilemma, but it's poorly drafted. They dealt with everything in terms of economic activities over the course of the crisis, and the schools were left at, as a footnote almost. The crisis was out of control, and we've witnessed a controversy, a specific controversy concerning the schools. You can't address this topic separately. And I think the important thing, in addition to everything that has been said with regard to the necessary measures for schools to reopen normally, there's a need for the epidemiological control in each location of this country because the schools will never be safe places in isolation if they're in a context of uh, lack of safety and widespread lack of safety in general and there's a need for each situation to be treated individually this is a nebraska document the manifesto establishing committees local committees and government's bodies with government and community representatives the school community and the health community to adopt the necessary measures for reopening the schools in each specific context then the government unfortunately didn't never had epidemiological control even with the, the specific part of epidemiological surveillance which is publishing data we've had several crises until the ruling by the supreme court that the government should was forced to transparently publish the data pertaining to the COVID-19. So there was no movement that we could by identify in the government for epidemiological control, true epidemiological control. Our measures are basically harm reduction, 
for people who fall ill or serious COVID-19 cases we don't have in practice in Brazil and say except in local situations uh, measures to reduce viral transmission I don't think the municipal elections change the scenario much although in the period prior to the elections we had more crowding and we also had a reduction in intervention power by many government authorities to the extent that oftentimes what was necessary to do could be viewed as uh, unpleasant or something that was opposed to their electoral wishes and desires very brief comment on the african countries extremely brief because i wasn't able i understood that there is a are a lot of questions concerning the situation in Africa. Of course, we had a huge fear of what might happen in Africa with the arrival of coronavirus. And this catastrophe is not happening, at least on the scale that was expected. As far as we know, there are some hypotheses that have been raised. So for example, one of them in the lower level of international integration of the African countries, especially during the period in which the entire world closed its borders and the paths and of flights the airline routes and maritime routes are not as many as in the rest of the world and the age pyramid in most of the african countries is quite different so when this would require a more in-depth study of course by calculating uh age adjusted mortality rates to better compare what has been happening in Africa and compared to the European countries. But if there's a huge question, and people have even raised the hypothesis that there was some kind of ethnic characteristic, but nevertheless, this is contradicted by the fact that the black population in the United States and even in Brazil have been affected even more heavily, more seriously for a number of determinants due to a number of determinants compared to the white population so there are a lot of questions and i think that i at least don't have better answers at least for the time being thank you very much claudio perhaps walter richardi and george rutherford could explain to us concerning the reopening of schools how it has worked and how it's working now this current stage in your respective countries? Uh, actually, in the first phase, we were the first country in the world to close schools and our closure was the longest. Uh, so we, we closed the schools and then we reopened that after uh, September. And uh, the reopening was okay. Let's keep uh, kindergarten and primary schools open while they have long distance uh, learning for higher school and uh, and colleges. So, and this is working because in all of Europe uh, now, I think we are reaching a peak. So we flatten the curve and we are optimistic about the future. So it depends on how you manage, but certainly kindergarten and primary school can be open even in times of uh, very strong uh, virus circulation, but you have to manage uh, uh, transportation, entrance and uh, uh, in-school activities very, very carefully. Thank you, Dr. Brandon. Dr. George, could you talk a little about uh, schools? Yeah, sure, sure. So in the United States, the schools closed. You know, it's all different everywhere, right? But uh, the schools, by and large, closed down when we went to shelter in place in March. And they, by and large, have not reopened yet. Uh, we got close. Um, it was all scheduled. And then there's been another takeoff. This is in California. Um, and now we're they're sort of back to waiting. Um, there were schools that opened in uh, many parts of the country in, in September, um, and they remain open. Uh, we have a very similar experience, I think, with Italy's, where we don't see a lot of transmission in elementary school or, or, or pre-kindergarten, three- and four-year-olds. But, you know, as they get older, they get more, you know, they get, they're, they're bigger transmitters, right? Um, and uh, so you, we're just going to see, how, we're just going to have to see. A lot of colleges, and this is such this is so regional in the United States. I mean, that's what you need to realize. So in some places, colleges have opened and have remained open and pay absolutely no attention to anything. Or 
They uh, have aggressive screening programs. Uh, For those of you who are interested, the University of Illinois has a particularly good screening program. Uh, And others have just said, we're not going to, we're not going to come back into session unless there's something you physically need to take, like a laboratory class or you're in performing arts and you have to do dance or something like that. Uh, but it's, they're really small. So, so the university of California, Berkeley um, is a um, uh, has maybe 26,000 students. They probably have a thousand students on campus. Um, and also and a lot of them are graduate students who are doing laboratory projects. So, it, we have a mixed bag. Um, I, I really admire the Europeans for focusing on keeping schools open and, and, and closing businesses. We've done it the other way around. Thanks so much for everybody. So we thank you, Dr. Tedros Adhaman, that's no longer here. Não está mais aqui conosco. E, uh, mas agradecemos muito. Dr. Tedros, we want to thank Dr. Mike Ryan for his important words and explanation and especially related to vaccines and the WHO attention declaring the pandemic. Dr. George Rutherford for his experience from the United States. Dr. Walter Picciardi for the experience in Italy. Dr. Claudio Mayerovic for the Brazilian experience and as well in several different places elsewhere in the world, and Galnar Azevedo Silva for her experience with the Brazilian Association of Collective Health and its activities. This beautiful overview and panorama and discussing all the activities that Abrasco, the association, has held. She highlighted the main ones, all the Abrasco team, which makes these things happen and to all of our listeners our heartfelt thanks and we'll see you tomorrow actually we'll have more at 4 p.m and friday through friday so thank you one and all for your patience participation and sharing your experience with us thank you good luck good luck Good luck with the conference. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye everybody. That was great. Goodbye. Obrigado. Muito obrigado.